historically test that claim using the tools available to us as historians. Well, the first thing, of course, we can do is we can do that by treating the, the New Testament Gospels, those four eyewitness accounts in the New Testament. You have one of them uh, on your table, a copy of John's Gospel there. Um, we can treat them not as sacred scripture or some kind of mystical writing. We can treat them in the same way that it, 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 as historians, we would treat any other ancient source. We might begin by thinking about their, their style of writing, their genre. And in terms of genre, in terms of style, what they are, the four Gospels in the New Testament, they are Greco-Roman biographies. And we can therefore assess them as we would any other ancient testimony. And when looking at ancient testimony, uh, as historians, we are interested in a number of things. We're interested in questions like, is our source early? Uh, is the source we're looking at close to the events? And in the case of the Gospels, yes they are. The Gospels are pretty, pretty early, uh, in fact. They're usually dated between about 60 AD and 90 AD, well within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. We're not dealing with documents written hundreds and hundreds of years after. In fact, some skeptical historians, some atheist historians, a uh, gentleman called James Crosley, for example, based at Sheffield University for a long time, or more, more regarded British historian, no faith in God, but he would date Mark's gospel uh, even into the 30s. He thinks it is very, very, very early indeed. So we're dealing with early documents. Secondly, we'd ask, do we have multiple sources? Are we reliant upon just one text telling us about the events we're looking at? Or do we have more than one? The good news is that when it comes to the Gospels, when it comes to the New Testament rather, we have at least six semi-independent sources there in the New Testament. And we also have multiple non-Christian sources too. We have people like the Jewish writer uh, Josephus, we have the Roman writer Tacitus, all giving us information about Jesus. As historians, uh, we have an embarrassment of riches. Uh, my PhD, interestingly enough, was not in early Christian history, it was in early Muslim history. And in early Islamic history, we would, historians would give our right arm for the quality of sources we have available in the New Testament, because there was nothing like that early level of material over in Islamic studies. And then thirdly, we would ask, are our sources credible? We've got early sources, we've got multiple sources. Are they, are they trustworthy? Do they, do they give us the clues, the indicators, that we're dealing with eyewitness testimony. And the answer for the Gospels is absolutely. They are chock a block with the kind of detail uh, that you'd expect to see in eyewitness testimony. Read the Gospels and you get names, places, dates, geographical information, political information, economic information, kind of detail that tells you that their authors either were eyewitnesses or were closely in contact uh, with them. And if you want to pursue that, by the way, in any further detail, uh, at St. Andrews University for many years was a wonderful first century historian called Richard Borkham, uh, who wrote a groundbreaking book a few years ago called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, giving you fascinating detail, the evidence why historians take the gospel seriously. Well, as historians have approached the New Testament, and as we've treated those sources there as historical documents, a number of core facts have emerged. In fact, there are five core facts that I would suggest to you are agreed upon by the vast, vast majority of historians, whether they're Christian historians, atheist historians, Jewish historians, no matter what they are, historians are largely agreed on these five facts around Jesus' death and resurrection. The five facts are, number one, that Jesus was killed by crucifixion. The number two, his tomb was discovered empty a few days later by a group of his women followers. Thirdly, that his followers had experiences in which they believed the risen Jesus had appeared to them. Fourthly, that skeptics were convinced and changed their view and they were converted. And fifthly, that the early church began as a result of the resurrection of Jesus. Let me quickly show you why the vast majority of critical, peer-reviewed, classical historians working in this field would agree with those five facts, would affirm those five facts, and then we'll end up by thinking about where do those facts point us. So let's begin with the crucifixion. Why do historians take it as a given that Jesus was crucified? Why the evidence is so strong? Well, the first reason is, of course, 
The crucifixion was deeply embarrassing to the first Christians. Most of the first Christians were Jewish. They believed Jesus was the Messiah, and the Messiah was supposed to fight and defeat Israel's enemies, the Romans, not get nailed to a cross by them. And it was a deeply embarrassing fact for the first Christians that their Messiah had been crucified. And uh, historians would say that embarrassment factor makes it very hard to imagine somebody would simply come up with this as a random fact of history. And in fact, the highly skeptical historian John Dominic Crossan, in one of his uh, massive books on the resurrection, he points out, he says, that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical ever can be. So if you want to deny the crucifixion, you might as well, quite frankly, deny the entire of recorded history because the evidence is so strong. Number fact number two, the empty tomb. The empty tomb. Uh, again, historians consider this historical bedrock for a number of reasons. Firstly, there's what some have called the Jerusalem factor. Christianity begins in Jerusalem, where Jesus was killed, uh, executed, and buried. And it's very hard to see how the first Christians could run around Jerusalem saying, he's been risen from the dead, and the skeptic would go, no, he's not, he's in that tomb up there, third on the left, you go check for yourself. If Christianity had begun hundreds of miles away from Jesus' burial site, maybe, but not in the same neck of the woods. Furthermore, recorded in the New Testament Gospels, we have the story that was being put around by the opponents of the early church, the religious leaders, the authorities, trying to squash the, the, the young Christian movement by putting around the story that the disciples had come and stolen Jesus' body out of the tomb. And what interests historians is that both the enemies of the early church and the first Christians agree on the pertinent facts. They both agree that the tomb was empty. The argument and the discussion is around why is it empty, but nobody was going around going, no, it's not empty, there's a body there in the grave. And finally, and perhaps most excitingly as a historian, is the fact that recorded in the Gospels is the fact that the people who first found the empty tomb was women. And the reason that is significant is in the ancient world, that was not an equal society like the one that we strive for in the world today. But that was a society in which women were very much viewed as second-class citizens. Their testimony was not taken as seriously as that of a man. And historians have therefore pointed out it's very problematic to imagine why, if you were trying to get Christianity started and you were making these stories up, why on earth you would have women discover the tomb? Why would you have Jesus' male followers, people Peter, James, John, good, reliable male first century witnesses? By all of our gospel accounts, it is women who discover the tomb. And as the, uh, as the skeptical Jewish historian Geza Vermesh uh, observed, he said the evidence furnished by female witnesses had no standing in a male-dominated society. If the empty tomb story had been manufactured by the primitive church, one would expect a full-proof account attributed to patently reliable male witnesses. So two facts so far, the death of Jesus, the empty tomb. Fact number three are the resurrection appearances. There are impressively wide variety of resurrection appearances described in our historical documents. We hear of Jesus appearing to groups ranging in size from two to five hundred. He also appears in different contexts at night, at day, in the morning, in the afternoon, sitting, standing, walking, indoors and outdoors, at a distance and close up and so on. And that immediately rules out hallucinations because hallucinations tend to occur to one person and always in the same type of setting. And historians would say the appearances simply do not fit that pattern. But then the other thing we run into is the transformative account, uh, the transformative impact of those resurrection appearances. If you remove them, you really struggle to explain the transformation in Jesus' followers. Uh, Pinkas Lapide, another uh, secular Jewish uh, historian, remarks on this in his book on the resurrection. He says, if the disciples were totally disappointed and on the verge of desperate flight because of the very real reason of the crucifixion, it took another very real reason to transform them from a bunch of dejected and disheartened Jews into the most, uh, most self-confident missionary society in world history. 
want to give you a, an atheist historian to add to the mix, though, so I'm not giving you Christian historians this lunchtime, I'm giving you those outside the church. Gerd Ludemann, a very skeptical atheist historian, says this. He remarks, it may be taken as historically certain, historically certain, that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus did appear to them as the risen Christ. He can find no other reason to account for the transformation in those men and women. Well, fourthly, and penultimately, we have the conversion of skeptics. We have people like Paul, uh, who ended up writing half of the New Testament. Well, we first encounter him uh, in history as a persecutor of the early church. He was a very committed Jew, and he hated the early Christian movement, and he was a persecutor and a violent, brutal bully. But his encounter with the resurrected Jesus turned him from a, from a murderer into one willing to die uh, for the, uh, his belief in the resurrection. And then we come to James, the brother of Jesus. And if you read the Gospels, you discover that he was a skeptic during the lifetime of his brother's public ministry. He didn't believe in his brother. And that's a really embarrassing fact for the Gospels to record. To have a Jewish rabbi like Jesus disbelieved by his own family, highly embarrassing, not a fact you're likely to make up. Well, what then happens is we know uh, from the New Testament that he was one of the early people who the resurrected Jesus appeared to, transforming him from a skeptic into a believer. He ends up going on to lead one of the first Christian churches uh, there in uh, Jerusalem. And the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that round about AD 60, James is killed. He is martyred for his belief in his brother's uh, resurrection. He doesn't deny it, but he goes to the grave wanting to die uh, for that belief. And that goes for many of those early first witnesses to the resurrection. And as one historian pointed out, liars make bad martyrs. Most human beings, if it comes to a life or death scenario, and you've been living for something you know that's not true, when push comes to shove, you give up, you deny it to the point your life is on the line. None of those early witnesses did. And then finally, my fifth fact for you this afternoon, we have the birth of the church. The early church began in the 30s uh, AD, almost immediately after Jesus' resurrection. Most of its first members, not all, but most were, were Jewish. But something caused them to entirely remodel their Jewish faith. They had a faith they were proud of, a faith that had served their community for 1,500 years. But they reshaped it, they turned it upside down, all around the idea of the resurrection. As one historian remarks, it's almost as if a, a resurrection-shaped bomb went off uh, in early Judaism. And if you remove the resurrection, if you say, well, it never happened, you would struggle as a historian to explain why did the early church begin? What was the cause behind it? So five facts for you uh, this lunchtime, all agreed upon by the majority of critical credentialed, peer-reviewed historians working in universities. That Jesus was crucified and buried, his tomb was discovered empty, there were resurrection appearances, skeptics were converted, and the early church began shaped around the resurrection. Which leads me, in conclusion, to the last question we need to think about this lunchtime. And that's this, what explains those five facts? What is the best explanation for those five pieces of historical data? And I would argue, as a historian, not as a follower of Jesus at this point, as a historian, that I think the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead is by far the most powerful explanation of the historical data we have in front of us. You see, when you get out there and you read the historians, when you do the work of history, you discover that most historians working today on this period of history do not think the first Christians made this story up. They don't think they were fibbing, but they actually believed all of this. Paula Friedrichsen, uh, American historian working in the first century, she's based at Boston uh, University. Again, not a believer. Uh, she is a, well, not a skeptic, but certainly secular uh, in her worldview. Uh, she puts it like this. She said, I know in their own terms, speaking of those first Christians, I know in their own terms that what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And then all the historical evidence we have afterwards attests to that uh, their conviction that that's what they saw. I don't know what they saw, but I do know, I do know as a historian, they must have seen something. This may be challenging for us as we think about this, this lunchtime. And it's challenging, I think, because if Jesus rose from the dead, that's not some neutral fact. 
I mean, yes, it would be very interesting for me to know whether Mallory and Irvine made the summit of Everest on the 8th of June 1924. Interesting. But it doesn't change anything. But if Jesus rose from the dead, it changes some things. Following that evidence where it leads has certainly changed me. But it can take courage to follow the evidence. It can be easy to brush it under the table, try not to think about it. But if we're going to take evidence and facts seriously, then we need to uh, follow the advice, I think, of the atheist historian, Bart Ehrman, who said the search for truth takes you where the evidence leads you, even if at first you don't want to go there. But one last thought I want to leave you with. So far in this discussion, we've missed something important. And it's the resurrection matters because of whom it happened to. It didn't happen to some, happen to some random person in history, but it happened to Jesus of Nazareth who made some extraordinary claims about himself. And I think that really matters. And it matters for this reason. You see, no matter how exciting your life is right now, no matter how thrilling and wonderful life is right now, it will end in suffering and in death. And that's why many people, by the way, as they get older, uh, begin to worry that the things perhaps they put their trust in when they were younger have let them down. That's why when you get a bit older in life, you can become a bit cynical, a bit jaded, if you're not careful. But if Jesus really rose from the dead, then his promises that those who put their trust in him and follow him will also share in his life after death, those promises that he made can be trusted. They are proven. And that changes everything. See, I turned uh, 50 last year, which means I'm certainly much nearer to death than most of you in this room. Uh, but as I get older, and as I follow Jesus more, I realize that I can look forward, actually, to the future. Not to the process of aging and dying itself. That can be horrible, right? But I do look forward to that experience of being with Jesus in the age to come. And the solid, concrete, historical, evidence-based reality of Jesus' resurrection reassures me that I'm not kidding myself. I'm not deluded, I'm not engaged in wish fulfillment, but my hope is based in something very, very real. I have a hope based in something that Jesus himself said. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, my answer to Jesus would be yes. And the reason I believe in Jesus is that I think people who rise from the dead have tremendous credibility. And also, I don't think you can beat the promise of eternal life. Thank you uh, for listening. There was a lot of evidence and information in there for you today. We're about to do some Q&A in a moment. But if you want to dig a bit more into the resurrection, if you go to my website, andybannister.net, and put forward slash Lancaster into the URL. That will bring you to a resurrection page with loads of historical information you can drill down on. So if you are intrigued you this lunchtime uh, in my brief 20 minutes, you can go deeper into the evidence and where it leads. Over to you folks. Research the historical evidence for Jesus as a non believer looking for what's out there, or as a Christian trying to solidify your faith? It was actually neither of those things, which was interesting. Perhaps leaning slightly towards the, the second one. So, in, the, uh, in my kind of mid 20s, mid to late 20s, I uh, was living in London at the time and uh, began having lots of discussions and dialogues with Muslim friends. Um, my Muslim friends believe very differently to me and would ask really good questions. And so I found myself thinking, okay, you know, I've been raised in the, in the church, in a church background, I have no answers for any of this. So I thought I want to set out and know what is true. And that led to two things. That led to doing a PhD in Islamic studies and looking into the early history of the Torah, uh, which is a whole other story. Um, and also then led to going really, really deep, particularly into the historicity and stuff around early, early Christianity. So really, I suppose the connecting point was a love of history. Um, so yeah, and that led me to the being utterly convinced far more than anything before that Christianity was true and with respect to Islam as well. If the evidence for the resurrection is so strong, why do some historians, some historians study the resurrection of Jesus and not believe in it? Yeah, so that's a really, really good question, whoever asked that. And one of the challenges is it's 
I don't think it's appropriate for me to sit here and psychoanalyze, you know, a Bart Ehrman or a Pinkastor P Day or a Paul Paul Friedrichson. That quote I ended with from Paul is very interesting because clearly thinks something happened. Clearly is willing to say that quite clearly, but it still holds back. But I think the reason from talking to a few people in this category is it is it's one thing to study something dispassionately. We're quite good at doing this in Western scholarship of keeping things at a distance. But the problem with the resurrection, once you realize it looks like this thing might have happened, it's not willing to stay at a distance. It's like it goes up against the window tapping and saying, you need to respond to this. And I think some people find the project very, very uncomfortable and they well, then draw back. Another good example of this, I think, would be Bart Ehrman, who I quoted, atheist historian. I haven't met Bart myself. I have a good friend of mine who's a, who's a historic first century historian, knows Bart quite well, and would say there it's really big worldview questions for him. I think he is well aware that some things would have to change and other big questions, and so he sort of grafted things off at a distance. So I think that's some of what's going on. Um, yeah, it's, um, you can't argue someone, I think, purely using evidence and, and, and arguments, so the Christian faith or, or any belief system. And you can look at the evidence, and then people have to decide, what am I going to do with this? But if you walk away, be honest as to why you're walking away. It's hard for something that happened so long ago to feel relevant to today. Why should we care when oh. most people are living fine without believing? Well, the first thing I would gently, uh, uh, I would gently cheaply say is actually, you're not living fine without that. If you are you know, enjoying life here in Lancaster, and living, enjoying life in the UK, in Europe, and in a Western country, huge amounts of what we take for granted, particularly in the West, but actually to some extent in the East as well, is based on holy Christian foundations. And there's been a lot of good work written on that. So just because we're talking history, I'll stay with history. To take someone like Tom Holland. Tom is a, a very well-regarded historian, uh, starting on the Roman period, but now in early Christianity as well. Um, a few years ago, he'd been an agnostic. He did not know what he believed. He, I think he's now a Christian. Um, but the book that made his name was a book called Dominion. And that book looks at how the Christian faith shaped virtually all the things we care the most about in the West. Freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of ideas, human rights. You're sitting there around this room today going, I'm glad I live in a world where human rights are taken seriously, justice or the biggest issues in our world today. The idea that the person sitting opposite you has value and dignity and rights, that did not come from nowhere. In the ancient world, it was taken as a given there was a pecking order. High class men, low class men, women, children, slaves. Some people were equal and some people were not. We rejected that idea, but we rejected it on Christian foundations. And so the French uh, atheist philosopher Luc Ferry, himself not a Christian, in his book, Brief History of Thought, says, I am, although I don't believe in Christianity, I'm incredibly grateful to the Christian faith, because without it, we would not have the world of human rights that we have today. So I would say Christian faith, uh, if Jesus rose from the dead, that is relevant for human rights. It's relevant for dignity. It's relevant for science and truth. It's relevant for beauty and art and aesthetics and music and law. The list goes on. Everything that you care about, I would say, probably traces itself back to Christianity, which raises the question of, if you are going to walk away from the Christian faith, are you willing to have the courage to go, I'm going to throw out with it the things that stand on it? Many people I meet, I think, of the goods of Christianity while actually not facing the question, is the foundation of those things true? Nice. Um, our next question is, why is the evidence of the Bible stronger than the evidence from the Quran? Let me just say a couple of things. I notice when I talk about the Bible today, I, I zeroed in on the, on the Gospels. People are often not aware that the Bible is not just one book, it's a library. It's a library of 66 different books uh, written by 40 different authors uh, over 1,500 years of history. And uh, so questions like, well, what do we make? Do we trust the Bible? That's a complex question if you're coming from outside the Christian faith. The Gospels, they're pretty easy. They're Greco-Roman biographies written within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses. We can treat them purely as historical documents. If we come over to the Quran and early Islam, and again, we don't ask questions about faith, we just ask historical questions, we run into some problems. Um, first problem you run into is the Quran does talk about Jesus, actually. There are 90 verses in the Quran that mention Jesus. And the Quran makes some fairly outlandish claims, for example, that claims that Jesus wasn't even crucified in the first place. But you're dealing with a Quran, with a document written 600 years after, no eyewitnesses involved, over a thousand miles from the events. So no historian would even consider the Quran as a historical source. It would be a meaningless question. But then when we come a bit closer into early Islam, 
We have a similar problem when it comes to the origins of Islam and perhaps the life of Muhammad, the founder of Islam. Muhammad dies in 632 AD. The first biography we have of Muhammad isn't written until over 100 years later by a guy called Ibn Ishaq, writing 100 years later. But we don't have his work, it was destroyed. We have an edited version of his work preserved by another historian called Ibn Hisham, who died in 833, 200 years after the events. And I mentioned in that throwaway remark that in early Islamic studies, the problem we have as historians is we lack good quality early sources. So early Christianity, we have Josephus, the Jewish historian, Tacitus, the Roman historian, and other writers from the period. There is nothing like that in early Islam. So I would say, purely speaking in historical terms, based on the quality of the sources and the evidence that we have, early Christianity stands head and shoulders above Islam. Um, that doesn't mean Islam is not worth discussion. It's fascinating. I've spent 25 years studying it and, and, and teaching it. But I don't think it's true. I don't think the evidence is there. You said Jesus' resurrection was the best explanation for the five bags. Yeah. What are some other theories explaining the teaching? Again, tempted to do a mini lecture. But there, are some, there have been some theories over the years. Because skeptics have realized they have to do something uh, with this. I remember really one of these stories years ago who talked about the fact he would lay awake at night at three in the morning worrying what happens uh, with the resurrection. I think he began to realize um, this was a very uncomfortable fact. So there have been attempts. Perhaps um, some of the most famous ones is the, is what's known as the swoon theory, which is the theory that Jesus didn't die on the cross, he only passed out, he lost blood, and he came around in the cool of the tomb, uh, was given some medical attention, and then wanders around and some people who were dead. Um, that, did, that, worked, that did the rounds for years. The problem is, though, um, as the 19th century atheist uh, skeptical writer David Friedrich Strauss pointed out in a book on this, he said it's very hard to imagine how somebody who's bleeding from multiple wounds, who's close to death, who needs urgent medical attention, how the heck did he convince people he was risen all of life? It's simply ludicrous. And you also run into the empty, uh, the empty tomb problem, because at some point Jesus will die, and at some point there is a body, and you still have the missing body problem. And one of the things that was interesting, I was commenting to, uh, to, to Sharon, who some of you heard last night speak, you know, one of the interesting bits of evidence that we didn't talk about today is a lack of tomb veneration. Every other major religious figure in history generally ends up with people venerating their tomb. So today, you can go and see the tomb of Muhammad or some of the other early Islamic figures there in Saudi Arabia. You can go and see, you can go and see where Buddha is supposed to be buried uh, or where other sort of, uh, some of the figures from Judaism, Jacob and Moses are traditionally buried. Um, but Jesus, no tradition of tomb veneration. There was never a body. So that rules out the swoon theory. You have things like the hallucination theory. Some have tried to claim well, maybe the disciples hallucinated. But again, hallucinations don't appear on maps to people. As historians, we don't know of any such category as mass hallucination. People have to throw that phrase around. We'd love to study it, but it doesn't happen. And then again, you have the empty tomb problem. How does it work out if the disciples are having hallucinations or visions, but well, there's a body over here? And first century Judaism had a category for visions. They could easily have said, oh, we've had a vision of our, uh, our beloved rabbi who was killed there at the right hand of God, and we know that one day we'll see him uh, at the end of history. The Jews had categories for those kind of things, and they didn't reach for them. And then lastly, you have the substitution, the substitution legend, which is that somebody else was killed in the place of Jesus. That's interesting, because that turns up in early Islam. Because uh, not in the Quran itself, but some early Islamic writers wrestling with the fact that the Quran denies the crucifixion of Jesus, but the evidence seems to be fairly strong. He was crucified, invented this idea that somebody else was crucified in the place of Jesus. In an early Islamic theology, Judas, uh, that traitorous disciple of Jesus, is often picked as a candidate. And the idea in some bits of Islamic theology is that God makes Judas look like Jesus, so the Romans crucify him, probably presumably they crying out from the cross, I'm not really the Messiah, but as you know, they're like Brian. Um, the problem with that is, again, you have a body at the end, because Jesus ends up somewhere. And the other problem you have is that you end up with Jesus participating in a lie. Because if Jesus knows he hasn't been killed, but he's wandering around telling his followers, oh, I was raised from the dead, now I want you to give your life to me, that makes you at the very best deluded, at the very worst, some evil lying manipulator uh, playing with people that way. And again, that doesn't really fit anything of what comes through the character of Jesus in those documents. And other than that, there really isn't anything. Uh, to go a huge number of contemporary historians writing in the period, I think they're increasingly the Paul Friedrichson route, and go, something happens, uh, but we don't know what. Um, and I respect their willingness to say history can only take you so far. I feel sometimes there is a moral cowardice in not being willing to follow those facts worthily. What about the 
Talpiot tomb as the place of Christ's burial in Yeshua. Right. Okay. So uh, yes, that's referring to there was a there was a, there was an ossuary, a bone box discovered a few years ago that had got some historians excited because it appeared to be a first century bone box with the name Jesus on it. Um, the reason no historian would think it thinks that's the, the Jesus of Nazareth is it's a for the evidence I pointed out today, but then secondly the fact that Jesus was a very very common name in the first century. We today really only know one first century Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, but actually it was very, very, very common name in the first century because it was the same name as the name of Joshua, a very important figure in the Old Testament. So a lot of Jesus is sloshing around uh, in the New Testament times, which, by the way, is another interesting insight into the Gospels being eyewitness testimony, because in the first century world, surnames didn't exist. People didn't have surnames. So if you had a very, very common name, like Jesus, or Simon, 40% of Jewish men in the first century in Jerusalem were called Simon. You walk into a coffee shop and call Simon after the audience stand up. Um, so you need to put a, uh, what historians call a disambiguator onto the name. That's a great sounding word. You can use that at a party and impress somebody. Disambiguator. And so that would be, you'd be Simon, son of John, or Simon the Tanner, or you know, Simon from the town that you lived in. Now that happened to Jesus. Jesus in the Gospels is Jesus of Nazareth. But a few years ago, historians noticed something quite interesting. When you read the Gospels, when the narrator, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John is writing in the Gospels, it's only ever Jesus. Because if you're reading Mark's Gospel or John's Gospel on your table, and you don't know which Jesus you're reading about, then you need to catch up quick. On the other hand, when reported speech, when the speech of crowds or other people that is reported in the Gospels, it is always Jesus of Nazareth which is exactly what you would say in the time period, because you would need to know which Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus son of Mary, Jesus the carpenter's son. So again, historians would say that attention to detail of knowing that Jesus needs a disambiguator in, on, on the end of his name in reported speech. That's the kind of fine detail uh, that is very hard to get right unless you're giving reliable eyewitness uh, evidence. So yeah, the, the bone box, interesting. No historian would think that is the... Uh, of Jesus, uh, but again, an insight into the first century world. What resources are there for looking into this further? What an absolutely brilliant question, and uh, isn't it lucky that someone has prepared a website for you? So you can go to uh, andybannister.net, uh, that's my uh, own blog, and then put forward slash Lancaster. And what I've tried to gather together there is uh, just some resources at both a popular level and at a more academic level if you want to dig into this a little bit further, some videos and stuff there. Uh, as well. So really, if you want to do a, a slightly uh, shallow but deeper dive than today, or even if you want to go right the way in down the rabbit hole into first century history around the resurrection, the stuff there. But I'd really just leave you with the encouragement, don't let this question rest. I think the evidence is incredibly compelling. And as I said at the end, what matters is who it happened to. And the biggest question that any of us can ask, I think, is who did Jesus think he was? Who did he claim to be? And what difference does the resurrection make those claims. Don't, don't let that question rest. That's what you want to say. Great. Well, thank you so much. That's been amazing. Thank you for coming. Thank you.